what I want to do is I'd like to take you on a tour now before lunch. My father was a naturalist and also a influential person in Boy Scouts nationally. He had a television show about nature and when we boys in Boy Scouts sat around the campfire at night, my father would take us on a tour of the heavens because he was an amateur astronomer as well. And he appreciated the sky actually like the prophets of old because before the word was written in alphabetic characters during the time of Moses, the word was written in the stars. And I'd like to take you on a tour. I have one of his scripts from his TV show, pencil written script, and it is concerning the star of Bethlehem. Oh, wow. Now, that night we would sit around the campfire as Boy Scouts and when the sky cleared and you were saying the sky is clear now with all the clouds because of the climate, whatever. Interesting. And he would always start out at the Big Dipper. You know, you guys have know where the Big Dipper is in the northern sky. It's pretty prominent. And so what you can do is you can find other constellations and stars starting from the Big Dipper and follow the two stars in the, in the Dipper part on either side and follow where they point up and down and find things. Also, you can follow the direction of the, the handle and follow it across the sky and find other things. And so uh, my dad would show us about all of those things, the lines up and down and either side. And in this fashion, we would travel the sky from constellation to constellation. We would see Cassiopeia, the bright W that's overhead usually. We would see the bright three stars in Orion's belt. And he would also point out to us the first magnitude stars that were used in ancient times for navigation. Sirius, the dog star, Arcturus, Betelgeus, and then we would strain our eyes to see if we could discern the colors. Betelgeus was red, Spica was blue, Arcturus was yellow-orange. If the conditions were right and you had good eyesight, you could just barely see the different colors of those stars. The Talgus is a red giant. It is bigger than the orbit of Mars around. If the sun were Betelgeus, that's how big Betelgeus would be. Okay? It's a red giant. But anyway, I'm going to take you on a different tour, what the prophets would do of old, because in the patriarchal era, that's all they had. Now, you've heard of the zodiac, right? The zodiac is 12 signs, and today it is used for astrology. Astrology, we're going to kick astrology and then you know what in this session here, <laughs> because... In astrology, there is a zodiac of 12 signs, and they're purportedly used to predict things in your life. But the problem is, it's off by one sign now. Okay? If you know about the movement of the Earth, one, the, the Earth moves around the Sun once a year, right? The Earth spins once a day right? Mm -hmm. Okay. The sun and the solar system is in the Milky Way, which spins every 200,000 years. The Milky Way is in the smaller, what's the name of that group in the universe? And so it's moving somewhere. So right now, you are actually moving hundreds of of thousands of miles an hour right now. But we don't know it. Because if there were a fixed point in space, it's already gone. We've already passed it. But one of the other movements of the Earth is it is spinning like a top 
And have you ever seen what, what happens with the top when it starts to slow down, it starts to wobble a little bit? Yeah. Where the axis wobbles? Well, the Earth wobbles every 26,000 years. Okay? Well, it's wobbled since the astrology was invented. So all those signs that supposedly they tell you about in the newspaper, they're, they're all wrong because they're, they're a sign off. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because back 4,000 years ago, when all of these different zodiacs were invented, the axis of the Earth was pointing somewhere else. It was not pointing at Polaris. It was pointing at a different star, and it was one sign of the 12 off. Do you understand now? No. In order to be one sign off, wouldn't you have to be 26,000 years off? No. 26,000 divided by 12, 12 signs. Okay. Oh, that. Okay. Right. Okay. So the 26,000 is the entire 12 signs. Yes, yeah, right. Okay. okay. See? So anyway, so it's, it's all off. But now here's something else fascinating. The Egyptian zodiac, the Babylonian zodiac, the Chinese zodiac, they all have 12 signs. They all are the same. What does that tell you? They were unified. There was a common ancestor before them. The common ancestor is what God told the prophets. Because Jewish tradition says Seth was an astronomer. Noah was an astronomer. Abraham was an astronomer. They used the stars as a mnemonic, a aid to memorization, to tell the story of redemption. Virgo is the virgin. Leo is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Isn't that amazing? Okay. And what's really neat about this is that the star names in each of the constellations, Virgo and Pisces and all those all around, Sagittarius, etc., the star names in Semitic languages all tell the story of redemption. So at night, Abraham would sit around the campfire with his people and take a tour of the heavens. Isn't that neat? So, <laughs> that's what they used to tell the story of redemption. It's not astrology, it's genuine astronomy. And so, there's 12 signs, they're in a circle, where do you start? Well, the place to start is with Virgo. The 12 signs in Hebrew are called the Maseroth. This is mentioned in Job 38. Can you bind the sweet influences of the Pleiades or loose the bands of Orion? Canst thou bring forth Maseroth in his season? See, it's seasonal. That's, these are the 12 signs. Can you guide Arcturus with his sons? Do you know the ordinances of heaven? Can you set the dominion thereof in the earth? Well, how, how do the stars have dominion on the earth? Not through astrology, but through the story of redemption. All right? So, very, very neat to see. The ancient prophets knew about the coming Messiah because of Adam passing it on, Seth passing it on, Noah passing it on, right? Okay? Shem passing it on. And they used the stars as an aid to the story of redemption, to remember the story of redemption. In Job 19, verse 23, Job said, Oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book, that they were graven with an iron pen and, li- and lead in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. So, Job knew of a coming redeemer, right? He also spoke of the daysman, right? So they knew 
about these. For example, Enoch also, he prophesied about the judgment that the, uh, the, the Lord was going to come with ten thousands of his saints. Now back then during Enoch's time, ten thousand was as high as they could conceive. Today we talk about millions and billions and trillions. But to them, ten thousand was huge. Okay, just like a trillion is, is huge, or zillion, right? <laughs> so, but anyway, what I'm about to share with you is based upon a book by E.W. Bullinger called Witness of the Stars. And it's available for free for download off of the internet. But where does the story begin? It begins with the woman. There is a star in Leo, which is the last one, the lion, named Sarkam, and that is the joining place for the circle. Okay, That's where the circle joins. It's the beginning and the end. And, like I said, the, the names of the constellations in Hebrew and the star names in Hebrew tell the story of redemption. Because, see, when they looked at the stars back then, they could see a shape of a woman, so to speak, in Virgo, all right? Well, why why would why they see a woman and not a man, okay? Cuz, you know, they didn't you couldn't see the hair in the in the in the stars, right? Why did they not see a man instead of a woman? Because the story of redemption and the star names talk about a woman. Okay? See? And then also the ecliptic. What the ecliptic is is where the sun travels, right? Along that line that goes Well, now see, I am up a little bit further north than you. So to me, the ecliptic is about there. But you're a little further south, so your ecliptic is up here. All right? When I was in Venezuela, the moon was straight overhead. That was weird. <laughs> but, but anyway, the, the way the sun travels is the ecliptic. And so then every season, there's a different set of stars in the sunrise Right when the sun rises, they go, they eclipse, right? That's, those are the different signs where the sun is in that sign. So, Virgo is a woman bearing a branch in her right hand and an ear of corn in her left. The, this is the promised seed of the woman. And the, uh, there are stars named Virgin. There are stars named the Branch, which is Jesus' nickname, the Sprout, the Semach, and that is in the corn. Uh, There's other star names that have to do with that. Then, with each of the 12 signs, they go along the, the ecliptic. But then there are three other constellations that go with each of the 12. See, if you take 360 degrees and divide it by 12, what is that? 360 divided by 12 is? 30. 30, right? Okay. And then you divide the 30 into 3. What's 30 divided by 3? 10. So 10 degrees, that is called a decan. It's a decan. Now, also another source for what I'm sharing with you is from my friend Rene Fretz who's a biblical astronomer, and he has the website www.try-god.com. Have to put the hyphen in. Try God with hyphen in between, dot com. It is a biblical astronomy site, and he has all this stuff on it, okay? So, every one of the 12 signs has a decan. 30 degrees divided by 3 is 10, and there's a three separate little... Um, other uh, constellations that go with each sign. And they all tell a story. So with Virgo, there's Coma. Coma is the desired, and it is a woman with a child. He's the desired of all nations. Then there's the centaur. That's the man and horse. 
and he's holding a spear and he is piercing a victim. That's the despised sin offering. Uh, then there's Butes, and this is a man wearing a branch called Arcturus, and Arcturus means he is coming. Okay, so this is the child, the desired of all nations, who is coming. All right. Then um, the second chapter is Libra. That's the scales, and that is the price that the redeemer had to pay. Then the decans that go with it are crooks, a cross, lupus, a victim, and corona, a crown. So he will die and be sacrificed and win a crown. Okay? So now, of course, when the prophets told this, they would explain more of the details that God would tell them because they knew about the coming Messiah. It just wasn't written down. It was memorized. Okay, now, you think about oral traditions. Well, they're not too trustworthy. Well, do you remember the TV show Roots? Yes. Okay? About how long? I don't know. About a decade or 15 years ago, whatever. Roots. And it was about people who had been kidnapped in Africa and become slaves and come over to the United States, right? And they were they were tracing their roots back, right? Okay. Well, in Africa, they had oral traditions. Okay. The kidnappers from uh, Europe that took them on the ships, they had writing. And so they kept records of who they captured where. Okay? Because they sold them. And so when they sold them, you you had to keep track of this money. It's valuable. So they kept track of it in writing. The writing of the records of the kidnappers in the ships matches the oral tradition of the African tribes who say, on such and such a day, so-and-so disappeared. Okay? So oral traditions, well, we think they might not be accurate, but see, this oral tradition was fixed in the stars. Do you understand? See, so. Next one, Scorpio. Scorpio is the scorpion, but it's being trodden underfoot by one of the constellations in the Deccans, which is Ophicius, which is a man grasping a serpent, struggling with the enemy, but also at the same time being wounded and also stepping on the scorpion's head. So there's a struggle, a titanic struggle between good and evil. And then Hercules is another one of the now, some of these constellations got renamed. Hercules is from Greek theology. But some of these constellations, the Greeks looked up there and they saw different stuff. For example, in NASA, they changed some of the constellations into just weird stuff. Just, just strange stuff, common everyday things. Because they didn't know the story of redemption and neither did the Greeks. So the Greeks renamed these. See, So Hercules, the mighty man, he's kneeled on one knee as if he's wounded but he's holding aloft the head the severed head of the one he has conquered so there's star names in there about treading underfoot star names of wounding star names the mighty one the head of him who bruises the branch kneeling so these, the star names actually tell you the story of redemption that fits with the pictures. Isn't that amazing? See? Next one. Redeemer's triumph. The Sagittarius, the archer. He's the bowman. He's shooting the arrow. The conqueror. Going forth, conquering and to conquer when Jesus Christ comes back in Revelation 19. And the harp, Lyra, is one of the decans. It's praise for the conqueror. Ara, the altar is the fire that he prepared for his enemies, and Draco is the dragon that's been cast down. So, and from the star names, you can see the story of redemption. 
Just amazing. Also, what's really interesting is in every constellation that portrays something to do with the adversary, Scorpio the Scorpion, Draco the Dragon, all right? Many of the stars in those constellations are variable. What do you mean? They get brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer on a cycle. Okay? Apparently, they're ecliptic with their debris or asteroid fields or whatever is the same as us. So there's, there's, there's dirt going around them that eclipses them from time to time. Does it make sense? Yeah. So they're variable. Also, there's other kinds of things going on uh, astronomically that can cause that. But it's amazing that many of the stars that are in the, the constellations depicting the elements of the adversary are variable. You can't trust them. You can't build anything on them. That may, it's just amazing. See? Of course, what fits with this is the Star of Bethlehem and how the Star of Bethlehem is the greatest scientific proof for the existence of God and the truth of the Bible because you can, you can wind back your planetariums, you can wind back your celestial computer programs, and you can see that back in the beginning that God spun the planets so ultimately they would line up and declare the birth of his son. See? And the wise men were astronomers, not astrologers, they were astronomers, and they understood some of these things in the heavens because Daniel was a prophet, Daniel was a head of the Magi in Babylon, and then something amazing happened. When the Persians took over Babylon, they kept Daniel. That never happens. They usually kill off all the leaders and the rulers of the old regime, right? Yeah. They kept Daniel. And so Daniel was the head of the Magi. Well, who were those wise men? Magi. You think they might have learned something from Daniel? Yeah. So that's why they showed up where? Bethlehem. Not Singapore. <laughs> you know? They showed up in Bethlehem when they saw the star. Okay, you see? Isn't that amazing? So, anyway, here's some more stuff. With all those variables, you can see how God is the creator of the heavens and the earth. But anyway, next one Capricorn. Now, this one is half fish and half goat. What? Well, how, how would they know that unless you have, you know, one of the, the brightest star, its name is Goat. Okay? <laughs> and the, the next one, the, uh, the fourth brightest star, its name is The Sacrifice Comes. And another star, its name was The Sacrifice Slain. And the deacon uh, stars are Sagitta, Aquila, and Daphinius. And the Daphinius is a dolphin, and it's the dead one rising again, like they leap out of the sea. And so this is talking about the sacrifice. The next one is Aquarius. This is the water bearer. But it's pouring out blessings. It's pouring them out. So the brightest star, the alpha star in Aquarius, its name is pouring forth. The second brightest star, its name is pour out. The fourth brightest star, its name is he goes and comes back. So, What's the name of that star? Pardon me? What's the name of that star? Yeah, the, he goes and he comes back. What's the name of the star? I don't. Oh well, I I haven't. I didn't write down that name. It's in Bollinger's. This is from now. This is from Bollinger's Witness of the Stars. Now, I have to tell you something about Bollinger's Witness of the Stars book. All right. E. W. Bollinger was a genius. He he was he was tremendous, and a lot of what I believe and what we believe actually comes from him. But E. W. Bollinger was a Trinitarian. Okay. And what he saw in the stars was he saw some of these things 
like the horse, half horse and half man. And he said those had two natures like the Messiah would have, supposedly, in theological circles, where he would be a God-man. Okay, two natures. Well, first of all, God-man is impossible because everything is after its kind. Okay, you can't have a God-man. I'm sorry, you cannot. You can't have a horsey dog or a horsey cow or a cowy horse or a catty dog either. Because everything is after its kind. It has to stay within its genus. All right, so God-man is impossible. When God created seed within Mary, it had to be compatible with Mary. Right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Okay? And it was her seed. If it came from a man, it would be his seed. So there you have the promise of the Messiah, because God would have to create seed in Mary for it to be her seed, but it would have to be the same seed as compatible with man. All right? And then... We know that there's 23 chromosomes, right? How that all fits with dominant and recessive genes. So if Mary had any weak genes in her egg, the seed that God created would have dominance that would counteract them. And so the Son of God could be perfect. That's how it works. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. So (laughs) I'm an honest researcher, and if I don't know, I don't know. Okay? And I'm not going to twist something. I'm not going to tell you something simply because it's my theology. Because what if I'm wrong? Then I'm responsible for what I'm teaching you. Right? And I don't want a millstone necklace. (laughs) Okay? So, you know, I was concerned about Isaiah 9 6 when I, you know, and I I said, God, you know the answer to that. Well, I was concerned about what Bullinger said with the two natures. Okay? But you know what? (laughs) Bollinger violated his own rules. He did the same thing that the Greeks did. They applied their theology to the constellations. And they ignored the star names. There are no star names with the word God in them at all. I mean, if it, if it was if he was a god man, if he had two natures, god and man, the star names would say so. You understand? Mm-hmm. See, so what he did, um, uh, bless his heart, but what he did is he he was anachronistic. That's the term, out of time. He was applying modern thinking back on ancient stuff. Okay, that's anachronistic. And uh, so he violated his own rules because he accused the the Greeks of doing the same thing by naming it Hercules. Okay? So anyway, so you have all the blessings poured forth and then the deacons with Aquarius are Pisces, Pegasus, and Cygnus. Pisces, it's huge amounts of fish. Those are the blessings, huge amounts bestowed. And Pegasus, the winged horse... Now, he doesn't talk about the dual nature of Pegasus, half bird, half horse. Why? Because it didn't fit his theology. But, why is Pegasus having wings? Because wings are swiftness and horses are swift. And so the blessings are coming quickly. (coughs) That's what the tradition is. Cygnus the swan. The blessers are surely returning. So, the star names are flying swiftly returning, coming back quick, returning from afar, who carries, who causes to flow, who goes and comes back, who pours out, who pours forth. You see it? And so, as the prophets of old would tell the story of redemption, they would tell the story of all these star names. It would help them remember the whole story. Isn't this fascinating? This is what they believed in the in the patriarchal administration before the word was written. Next one, Pisces, the fish. This is the redeemed, blessed. Uh, you have the band, which is binding together. You have Andromeda, which is the chained woman. And you have Cepheus, the redeemer coming to rule. So... These blessings, Pisces is also indicative of Israel, and so you have star names of broken down, weak, struck down, and then the Redeemer coming quickly. Next one, Aries is the the ram or the lamb. 
This is the lamb that was slain. Cassiopeia is in the Deccan of Ares. She is the woman that's a that's delivered and preparing for her husband, the Redeemer. Cetus is the sea monster, the great enemy that's bound. And Perseus is the breaker who delivers. He is the Redeemer. And so in this group, you have stars named Bound, Freed, Coming in Victory, Helper, Who Carries Away, Who Breaks. So these are the monomic for that stage. Next one, the Redeemer, the coming Redeemer, the glory that should follow is Taurus, the bull. He is the Messiah coming to rule. His brightest star name is Ruler. Orion. Orion is a picture of the coming Messiah with the belt across the sky, the light breaking forth. His brightest star is named Simak, which is Jesus' nickname. He's the branch. He's the sprout. See, The second brightest star in the foot of Orion that is crushing the enemy is the foot that crushes. That's the name of the second brightest star. Isn't that amazing? See. Then, the other ones are Eridanus, which is a river, because those are the blessings flowing forth, and it's full of star names referring to rivers, various parts. And then, Arguria is the last decan in there. He's the shepherd. He's the safety for the redeemed in the day of wrath. And his star names are goat, chain of goats, and flock of goats. See, a lot of this has been lost over the ages because it was not rewritten down or it was corrupted into astrology. Okay? But even though that occurred, there are still vestiges left in the constellation names in Semitic languages and the star names in Semitic languages. So... Rene Fretz, the astronomer, his, his job, if he decides to accept it, is to figure this out, and the universe won't just self-destruct in, in 10 seconds. But anyway, um, <laughs> we talked about that yesterday. But isn't this fascinating? Let's see here. Gemini is the twins. Rules and tread underfoot are, char- are the star names there. Lepus is the enemy. He's trodden underfoot. It's full of star names like Enemy, the Mad One, the Deceiver. Canis Major is the dog. And uh, Sirius, the brightest star in the heavens, is there. And its name in Hebrew is Prince. Sirius is Prince. Ruler is another star. Shining, glorious, chief at the right hand. Canis Minor is the second dog. uh, Or uh, Prokylon. And its star names are Redeemer, or Bearing for Others, or uh, Chief of the Left Hand, or He Who Completes. So these tell all the different aspects of redemption. Cancer is the next one. It's the possession. There's a ship in there that's full of pilgrims that are safe. And the last sign is Leo. Leo is the Messiah's triumph. And its brightest star means treading underfoot. And its second brightest star is the judge is coming. Here come the judge. Leo the lion, the Deccans in there, are Hydra, the serpent. And that's the devil destroyed. The brightest star in that one is put away. (laughs) Crater, the cup, the cup of divine wrath poured out. And finally Corvus, the raven, the birds of prey devouring the adversary and the star names there the brightest one is accursed the second brightest one is raven and one of the other ones is the raven tearing to pieces okay so you can get more information on these from Bullinger's witness of the stars and now that you know what to watch out for, you'll see where he he takes off in his theology about the two natures stuff. But what he does is, since many of the prophets were also astronomers, he quotes stuff in scripture that relates to this. I, I have talked with Rene 
about doing a star show at a planetarium mm. where something like this could be portrayed and you'd take a whole afternoon and just go through the whole thing and see it. Mm. Uh, I had the opportunity of doing something similar in 1996 at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History where I got to I got to be the MC at a planetarium show about the Star of Bethlehem. And we saw all the stuff that was all part of the Star of Bethlehem. And the most difficult part of the whole thing was me doing it in the dark without notes. <laughs> so, but anyway. But the overall theme in the stars, the story of redemption, is the seed of the woman. Okay? And then the Christ comes and bruises and crushes the adversary's head, rulership. And then the Redeemer wins the crown. And then the Redeemer, after fighting the serpent and being victorious, he crushes the serpent. But then, also in the stars, it shows that the Redeemer is cast down because that's the adversary bruising his heel. All right? Now, he shall crush thy head in Genesis 3.15. What's head indicative of? Rulership. rulership. So, the Messiah will bruise or crush the adversary's rulership. What rulership was that? It was what Adam had, the dominion of the earth, that then was surrendered because... In order to have dominion of the earth, Adam needed to have spirit in order to do it, and he lost the spirit because he sinned. In that day, thou shalt surely die. Right? Mm -hmm. So then, it was transferred to the only one left, which was the adversary. So today, the devil misuses the dominion of the earth that Adam once had. And so, when Jesus came, he raised his heel against that dominion. What is raising the heel indicative of? It's kicking up against, right? It's rebellion. Jesus was leading a holy insurrection against the adversary's rule and he crushed the adversary, apparently, crushed it in the crucifixion. But then in the heavens it said, the dolphin comes up and rises from the dead. See, you see how all of that was told? So that's what they believed. That's what, they, that's what the prophets of old taught at night around the campfire. And then there are these other symbols that we know about the king and the shepherd and the offering, the peace offering, okay, uh, Shiloh. Those are also known. But then, the missing ones in the stars are the rock, the star, and the lawgiver. The rock, he's the head of the body. Was that part of the mystery? Yeah. Okay. Now, the closest they get, the closest they get to the mystery in the stars is in the book of Job, where... He says, he, he stretches, it's Job 26, he stretches the north over the empty place. There is a spot out in the constellations that's empty. Okay? No stars. And so they said, well, that's indicative of something. What is it indicative of? Well, it's a mystery. They know, like the prophets, they knew something was up, but they didn't know what it was. Right? Okay? Guess what? The Hubble Space Telescope in 1995 pointed at a spot in the heavens where there apparently was no stars. Hubble pointed at that empty place that Job talked about. And you've seen the picture, right? It's called the Hubble Deep Field. Have you seen that picture? So all the galaxies. That's the mystery. And the galaxies are us. But they couldn't be seen from Earth with the naked eye at least. So they were still a mystery. 
Isn't that fascinating? It's <laughs> yeah, <it's> something. <laughs> Praise God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So, those are some of the things that they saw back then. So, in the Thanks last... For the tour. Pardon me? Thanks for the tour. <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? That, but anyway, that's what my dad did when he was, we were in Boy Scouts. He would tell us about the heavens. He just didn't know all this stuff. So I'm carrying on the family tradition in two ways because the first way is I have a book on the Star of Bethlehem carrying on my father's research from his TV show in 1953. And the next one is um, what I just taught you. And don't you have the book, uh, the Kindle book? Uh, happy belated birthday, Jesus. Oh yeah, I have a, I do have a Kindle book. By the way, if you guys are interested in purchasing any of my books on the Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on the Plain, Sermon in the Valley, I can take orders. Leadership in the Body of Christ, that's another one. But I do have a book that's a Kindle book only, which is Happy Belated Birthday, Jesus, which is uh, the, the Star of Bethlehem. And my daughter designed the cover on that. So, anyway. So, bless you. We're going to take a lunch break.